right button we are live <laughs> all right welcome to axe the blood god episode 444 here recording live on january 20th 2024 heading out to the podcast feeds on january 22nd 2024 i am eric van allen joined by my co-host nadia oxford nadia how are you doing uh, I just realized we're 444. Four, four. That's extremely lucky. That's like if you're uh, Asian but believe in the devil. And uh, that's like <laughs> double unlucky. I mean, oh, is it four man. an unlucky number? In uh, I know tr buildings in Toronto don't even have the, the level four anymore. Whoa, really? Yeah. Four, Do you have to be Asian? Asian? Should uh, I not be on the fourth floor? I'm on the third floor of my apartment. I mean, buildings are built without a fourth floor now. That's crazy. No four, no 13. It's pretty great. Okay, all right. Good to know. Thank you. <laughs> that other voice you hear is the one, the only Michael Hyam joining us. <laughs> Michael, how are you doing? I am wide awake. You know, I got up real right. early this morning, ready to go. You know what I'm saying? You beat um, both of us here. I did. Mm -hmm. I sure did. Um, so, you know what I'm saying? I'm uh, I'm ready for this. I believe in you. I, I have faith. I know what you're saying, for sure. <laughs> you have to. Cat uh, cannot be here. Cat is taking a much deserved vacay right now. Um, I'm not going to come up with a fake thing that Cat is out sailing the high seas for <laughs> this time. But <laughs> uh, in her stead, we have brought on Michael Hyam to talk about RGG Studio, aka. I'm not going to try to pronounce it. I always butcher it every time I try to pronounce it. Uh, Ryu Ga Gotoku Sto Studio. See, I, I messed it up. Uh, oh, makers yeah. of the Yakuza slash Like a Dragon series. Obviously, Like a Dragon Infinite Wealth is just around the corner. And I thought we would take a moment to do a little something that we here like to call the Dev Quest, which uh, yeah. we look back at the history of a studio, its development timeline, and talk about its impact on the RPG genre. And I think... This is going to be a really interesting conversation because I'm going to pose some questions to y'all about where RGG fits in the grand scheme of the RPG scene. But before we get there, of course, as I mentioned before, we are now recording live every weekend on twitch.tv slash bloodgodpod. So if you haven't tuned into that yet, we would love to have you every Saturday morning, 9 a.m. PT. You can catch us there. Also, we are, I promise, I know I've said this many times before, we're restarting other live streaming efforts. So we're, we're, we're going to finish Chrono Trigger. I'm serious. We're going to finish Chrono Trigger, and then we're going to start Final Fantasy VI, and there might be some other live streaming stuff uh, that, that starts up to, uh, we've tossed around a few different ideas. Uh, I do know that around the time of, of February, March, heading into some big games uh, like, like Rebirth and, and Unicorn Overlord and, and Dragon's Dogma yeah. 2, we really want to push this channel and uh, try and get it to a place where we've got a pretty stable viewership and, and shows rolling out and things like that. Uh, so we hope you join us for that. And uh, we hope you participate because this has been really fun. It's been a really new, uh, fresh, interesting way to approach Blood God stuff and to, to interact, especially with the community, like to do stuff with y'all that is very live and, and interacting. We've already had we've already had that with the Stars of Destiny in the live chat, but having that here in the Twitch is really, really fun, too. So we hope you join us we hope you. i like uh, watching you uh kind of try to make everything work eric you're very good and also it's kind of like watching that infomercial guy who's like got his arms full of shit and he's like dropping everything the host mm. sprays everywhere yeah but you yeah, make it all come together at that, the end that's, that's me trying to to make everything work i, I thought you were going to compare me to which was was it ubisoft that had that one e3 presenter that was just constantly like just super on edge the whole time just like oh we're so excited for you guys to go we're so we're so ready right now and i was like <laughs> this this dude 
What was he doing backstage before the presentation started? <laughs> I don't know, but I hope he shared. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, besides the live streams, we, of course, have our Patreon, patreon.com slash bloodgodpod, where you can go support us, back us. Uh, we've got tons of different tiers. Uh, we even have the stars of Destiny who get to watch us put this whole thing together. You get to hang out in the pre-show and watch the sausage get made, and you get a little post-show every week uh, where we just kind of vibe and talk about whatever. And if you want to participate in that, you can head over there and, and back there. We also are now selling a la carte episodes of some of our back catalog of Pantheon episodes. So if there's a Pantheon episode you've always wanted to check out and listen to, but you don't really want to up your sub, worry about the subscription service stuff, you can always head over there and just pick up an a la carte episode and tune in. We've got some great ones on the back catalog. It, I personally recommend Lunar Silver Star Story. That is one of my favorite Pantheon episodes we've ever done. It is hilarious. Ooh. It goes off the rails. Shadow Madness gets in there somehow. Shadow. I forgot about Shadow Madness. How can I forget about that in Monster Seed? Monster Seed. Well, Monster, Monster Seed, Seed was the live stream. Excuse the, me? Was yes. Monster Seed uh, last year's live stream or the one before it? The the charity stream. Don't play ignorant. I've seen your I've seen your history. Yeah. I am I don't I don't know what that history. is. I don't know. Nadia be looking at some I know I know what you'd be reading out there. Uh yeah, and, and also as Char Bundle notes in the, the Twitch chat, Mario RPG, also an all timer. Heck, you can go back and listen to. I don't think some of our more recent ones are on there. I think we're trying to to keep a balance of what's recent uh, still being available to the Pantheon versus a la carte. But we've got a great back catalog stuff we're, we're very, very proud of. And we love that we're able to now offer that as kind of an option for people who just want to listen to maybe one but don't want to, like, up their sub. And, and if you do end up liking more, you can always up the sub, go listen to the back catalog. It's all good. So... Anyways, we also have Charlie and Dropouts. Go follow Vic and all the stuff that uh, the Dropouts are doing over there. Uh, we're moving to weekly episodes for Dropouts. Yeah. Uh, Vic has really upped production, has been doing a ton for the Final Fantasy XIV side. So if you are a fourteen sicko or you're fourteen curious, you want to check out fourteen, you head over there. You have a good time. Uh, Vic Everybody really, really should be Dropouts. Final Fantasy fourteen sexual. Mm, mm. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> I know you would. Yep. See, you know what it's about. <laughs> I wouldn't put it that way, but I agree. Actually, I would. On that note, uh, let's head into the main topic of this week's show, the RGG Dev Quest. Those of you who have subbed to our specials tier uh, may know what the Dev Quest is, but for those who are new to it, uh, Dev Quest is a special that we used to do where we would kind of pick out a studio, look at its history, and talk about its impact on the genre and uh, what it could do moving forward. This is kind of a retrospective, also looking forward. It's also a little bit condensed because we're putting this in the main show now, but we love doing the dev quests and we wanted to talk about RGG because it's a very interesting studio to talk about right now, especially with Infinite Wealth. It's second, arguably, RPG coming out, but we may also talk about whether RGG has always been making RPGs in secrets. <laughs> Whoa, yes. dude. But with the impending launch of Like a Dragon Infinite Wealth on January 26th, we're looking at the history, their influence, their inspirations, and examining whether RGG is becoming a major RPG dev. So let's talk a little bit about the history of RGG, which stretches all the way back to 1989 when Toshihiro Nagoshi joins Sega as a designer and works on games like Virtua Racing, Daytona, Daytona, Daytona. <laughs> <Let's go away. laughs> and uh, Spike Out, which is in Infinite Wealth. They have announced that already, that Spike Out is in Infinite Wealth, which is kind of a cool little Easter egg uh, character action game where uh, the goal was to kind of play a bunch and do a bunch of character action stuff and have fun, which was maybe at odds with arcades at the time, <laughs> in a way. Yeah. Um, Eventually, Sega would restructure the development teams into various studios in 2000, and Nagoshi would head up Amusement Vision, which is kind of the precursor, I would say, to RGG at Sega, uh, which would go on to make Super Monkey Ball. And, mm. oh, God, I love Super Monkey Ball. Curse and that I'll... game. Talk about the vomit simulator. If you're if you're motion sick or if you're susceptible to it at all, that is not a game for you, as I have learned the hard Ooh. way. Michael, are you a Super Monkey Ball fan? You played Super no. Monkey Ball? 
No, I mean, really? well, yeah, but I'm, I'm like, I don't it doesn't really do much for me. But I, because I had a GameCube when I was a kid, and like there was a time when oh, right. there was a big drought of games on GameCube. This, I think, this was before, this is before like Wind Waker, Metroid Prime, and Super Mario Sunshine had come out. And I'm like, yo, what the hell do we get for the GameCube? My brother's like, here's these monkey balls. I'm like, all right, I'll, I'll play it. And uh, I, it really did, did nothing for me. So sorry, sorry, Negoshi. I wasn't, I wasn't. I wasn't fucking with you back then. <laughs> Put Yakuza on GameCube. Balls. Yeah. Hey, yo. Put Yakuza on GameCube. Put Yakuza on GameCube. Imagine Cube. if Kiryu was oh. on GameCube. It, in the Mario crossover they'd have, like you give him a Mario costume while he's beating the shit out of someone, that'd be pretty they funny. Would, they would finally put him in Smash. It's... If Kiryu gets into Smash before he get, well, he can't get into Tekken. He couldn't be in Smash either. Kiryu doesn't doesn't punch. Yeah, him. yeah, that's, that's a rule. Oh, good point. Yeah. Jesus. Oh, but like, oh, him fighting Samus, that would be like the sexiest thing ever. <laughs> that's what AO3 is for. Hey, everyone, I have a new idea is for that. A what AO3 is for? I've come up with a new recipe. <laughs> Uh, there's another GameCube game that uh, Amusement Vision worked on alongside Nintendo uh, that you might know from the GameCube era called F Zero GX. Now that heck yeah, come on, Haim, tell me you played some F Zero. Yeah, I played F Zero. That's how I know about Captain Fal Falco Fal Fal Falcon. Captain, Captain Falcon. Falcon. Right I get Fal You're so close. <laughs> he does I'm... say Falco Punch, or it sounds yeah, like he's saying Falco yeah. Punch. So I'm a I bigger star. Yeah, I'm a bigger Star Fox. Star Fox guy, but you know, I, I'm I messed with F F Zero GX, F Zero GX specifically because I did not like F Zero on the SNES. No. I thought that I thought that shit was whack as fuck. Sorry. <laughs> Why was it whack specifically? I just didn't like. I, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't really like any of the racing. I even like Mario Kart on SNES. I just. I don't know. No. I, I was I was into it, but F Zero GX, yeah, yeah I, I messed with that. That and Wipeout were like were wild. Wipeout was oh. great. Yeah. Wipeout's a classic. F Zero yeah. GX was the game that got me really into like high speed racing because I think up to yeah. that point I'd only played like Need for Speed and things like Gran that. Gran Turismo. Oh, okay. Look, Gran Turismo is a different kind of racing sicko. Like F Zero is you just need like breakneck speed and always going faster, <laughs> like redlining yeah. it. And Gran Turismo is like I'm gonna jump in for a spot of sport racing this morning. Hey, whoa, 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 hey, whoa, 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 whoa! Don't call me British. <laughs> I like. I don't know why. Like my brain, maybe it's because of, like Top Gear or something. But my brain just like associates Gran Turismo with the UK. I feel like the UK <laughs> likes Gran Turismo. If you're in the UK and you hate Gran Turismo, please DM Cat. <laughs> don't DM me. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna text Lucy. Supposedly in Iceland, <laughs> saying what the, what the hell? Um, Why are people texting me about Gran Turismo? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, no. So we got Super Monkey Ball, we got F Zero GX, and then somehow along the way, in 2004, Sammy Corporation takes a controlling share of Sega, forms the Sega Sammy Holdings. Everything kind of starts to move around, and. By a certain point, around 2005, from the research I was doing last night, uh, most AV members were folded into the new entertainment R&D department, uh, and a pitch for Like a Dragon, uh, aka Yakuza, started going around, and it was eventually successful, launched, and kicked off an entire series. RGG Studio was formed under the success through Sega CS1 of uh to, to just make yakuza and to, to pump out yakuza games and so we have one two three four five six then they jump back well i mean it was between five and six that they went back to yeah. zero and then did mm -hmm. kiwami as well and then you have dead dead souls i always get it mixed up with dark souls dead, dead souls, souls yeah. uh ishin uh the more recent gaiden uh they did kenzon Kenzo. That was, oh. That was that was the that was the, the PSP one, right? No, that that wasn't PSP. That was the it was basically Ishin but a different era in Japanese history. I think it was like the 1600s or oh. earlier than that. Oh, okay. What's yeah. the PSP game I'm thinking of? They did they did do it. They PSP did they do they did two PSP games and it was about like a a, a troublemaking youth, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. Or at least it was a very similar, yeah. Anyway, and they also even did like RGG Online and, of course, the Judgment Games. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of stuff. 
around Yakuza. Yakuza became a franchise in a way. Uh, so the first question I'm going to pose to y'all, uh, what, what was your introduction to RGG? And we'll start with Michael. How did you get started with RGG studio oh, games? Man, let me tell you, let me take you back to 2017. I feel like, I feel like 2017 was the year everything changed for me. Cause that was, uh, Persona 5, uh, Yakuza 0 and Kiwami 1 and Nier Automata right. and Zero was my my introduction to the series. So I was working at GameSpot at the time. I was still fairly new there. And my, our reviews editor, Peter Brown, uh, reviewed Yakuza 0. And I had, like, very little understanding of the series and all. So I was... He, he would tell everyone, come over to his desk. And he's like, yo, check out this mini game I'm playing. And I think it was... It was um, one of the like uh, ones where Kiryu's on the phone talking to talking to girls or some shit or oh, like VHS yeah. <laughs> tape stuff. And he's like, "Yo, this shit is wild. Check this shit out." And like, so he had been with the series for a long time. So like, he, it was all it wasn't none of that was like new to him. But he was like showing everyone was like, "Hey, check out this game I reviewed." And then he like live streamed it to him and uh, Rob Hanley back in the GameSpot days. We were having a good time, and I was like, "Wow, this is really interesting." And he said, "Said yeah, you 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 like Persona? You should totally play. You should you should play this game." You. It's like it's not the same thing, but um, there are similarities in uh, like the things that you like about that game are also present yeah. in Yakuza, and I was like, oh, okay, sure. Um, so I picked up Zero, and that thing changed my life, man. Like the thing with Zero was uh, like that—that that was the game I would rush home to play uh, every time after work. Uh, I would come home. I would like get ready. I would get into my cozy clothes, pour me a drink. It's like you know what? I'm playing Yakuza tonight, and that is what I am doing. Uh, I like uh, had these like these wild edibles. You know what I'm saying? I would just down down yeah, those. Yeah, because on like, edibles. Yo, it, it was crazy because like zero. It was my first introduction to the series, so all all that stuff was it was like a playground to me, and uh, like every mini game I played, every mini, mini game sometimes. I wouldn't even adva advance the story. I would just be like dancing. I would yeah. be in karaoke. I would be playing pool. And there's something about the like the ambient um, sounds of that world, like the music that plays in the background of the bar, uh, just the crowds. The the you can hear the sounds of like the clubs playing as you're walking by. And there was it was like this really surreal experience where it really uh, maybe it was just edibles, but. It really felt like I was there because Zero is also kind of a period piece in a, in a, in a way where it really captures that late 80s vibe. Um, I don't know if it's just like the color grading or something that like makes me feel like I'm somewhere else. Uh, but there's just, there's just such a there's an atmosphere to Kamurocho in Yakuza Zero. And right then from there, I was like, oh, Kamurocho is like a place like mm -hmm. it is a place to be. Um, and little did I know that the entire series revolves around that place. Uh, it is as much of a character as anyone else in that series. And it, it grows up with time and it changes. And um, I didn't realize that I was in for such a ride <laughs> at the time. I was just like, oh, this is like a like a really fun and funny game that's also very serious. And then when I finished Zero, I was like, oh, okay, this, this, this series is... I'm playing the rest of the series. And that's what I did in that year was I played Kiwami 1. I got a PS2 to play too. Um, then I got a PS3 off of, off of like the the shelves at the GameSpot office. And I played three, four, five, um, and then eventually got to six. Argued for it to be one of the top ten games of 2018. Did not succeed. Uh, and then nah. from then on, it was kind of like, well, I'm waiting for Judgment, and now I'm waiting for Yakuza Seven. I'm waiting for Lost. Like I'm, this has been constantly like, what's the next RGG thing? And I think. Over the years, I've been able to cover the series uh, in various forms, interviewing people like Daisuke Sato, uh, Toshi Nagoshi. I did um, a state live stage interview at E3 with Nagoshi uh, for Judgment. And just like various interviews, features, reviews, and uh, things like that. So uh, yeah, Zero, basically. Uh, Zero has been not only like one of my favorite games of all time, uh, it has also been very important to my career. Uh, mm. Honestly, uh, like it's it's been it, Yakuza has played a huge role in my career in games media. So, thank you, Yakuza Zero. Thanks, RGG. One of the things you could say about this industry, as much as it can suck sometimes, at least it gives you the opportunity to talk to the people who kind of helped you get you where you are in terms yeah. of like 
uh, the the games that you love. Um, just the amount of people I've interviewed in the past, it's just like so humbling and so incredible. Especially like <laughs> Yuji Horii, like yeah. the reason I started, one of the reasons I started writing in the first place. Just yeah, it uh, makes up <laughs> for the bill collectors, I suppose. <laughs> oh, it it is really interesting. Maybe sometimes a bit nerve wracking to sit down with somebody and be like, okay, this is someone whose work has like highly influenced not just. Yeah, it's one thing to like really be a fan of somebody, mm -hmm. but there's something about when you have a an attachment to a work that you have built a body of your own work on top of, right? So yeah. sitting down yeah. with someone who like I I have written a ton about this game, I've written a ton of critique, like I've kind of built my quote unquote writer's brand around your your yeah. property, and now like getting getting to sit down, it's it's. I wouldn't call it like starstruck. It's more like you, you have this moment of really being able to talk with somebody and in the best case scenarios, like really connect with them and understand this thing that you've already developed your own attachment to so much better. And that is like such a valuable moment that, that yeah. can happen sometimes. Yeah, it's even it's, better when you're independent and you can ask them the stupidest questions because nobody <laughs> cares about SEO. So it's like, you know, oh, what's your favorite man. breakfast cereal? I think it was Alex Donaldson was on Remap or something recently. I was listening to a podcast as I was uh, out touching some grass the other day. And uh, <laughs> oh? <laughs> Donaldson was talking about getting to sit down with folks who worked on Final Fantasy VII and just flinging a bunch of questions at them about all the different fan theories that existed back in the days of uh, early internet forums and FF7 uh, and all that. And just like, oh, why do you think about this? What do you think about that? And I cannot imagine how much fun that must have been to just finally oh. throw those questions at people. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> like, I would love uh, to sit down with some of the makers of Pokemon Red and Blue and be like, did you ever see the thing about Mew and the truck and how you had to move it with strength with the SSN and all that? Like, <laughs> has blue. anyone ever talked to them about that? I would love to find that out. So. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, it's, uh, I will say, uh, Nagoshi, Toshiro Nagoshi is, that dude is a character. So, um, when in 2019 at E3, he shows up uh, and that dude is just like, he's wearing uh, like basketball shorts with Under Armour leggings, Jordans, and a leather jacket. And he's got like, he's, he doesn't like, we were in the back, in the back rooms because I was getting my makeup done or whatever to get on stage. And then they're like, oh yeah, dude, do we need to touch you up? He's like, no, 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 no a man of very few words. And he was just, just standing there. Very intimidating. I think he's like also like six feet tall. I'm six feet tall. Uh, and then he shows up and and he's like this he he dresses just like um uh Zhao from uh like a dragon from Yakuza like a dragon he I swear that character is just modeled after Toshiro Nagoshi because that is exactly how he dressed when we had him at, at E3 in 2019 so uh That's yeah amazing. that that dude is uh kind of intimidating but once you start uh start talking with him uh he's he's very uh he seems like a very soft-spoken guy, ah. and yeah, he's a uh, he. He lo he looks. He tries to look tough, but he's he's a softy for sure. I know guys like that. Uh, when I was a dog groomer, they'd always be like this, like humong. I remember this humongous like guy, like six whatever, and he had this like little tiny uh, Shih Tzu that he absolutely adored, and he would put a medallion of uh, what is it, Saint? Um, can't remember the Saint of animal of protectors in uh, in Catholicism uh, but he'd have like a little medallion on the dog just to protect him and I just love shit like that it just makes my heart melt <laughs> I mean I'm not a Catholic so I'm not a bad Catholic for forgetting that but I feel like I should know that information but while I try to St. Francis there we go uh, Nadia what about you what's mm. your history with RGG it's funny like RGG the uh Yakuza games are certainly on my list of games that I really need to get into and finish. Like I know some of them. Uh you, I, I was going to tell the the listeners that Michael is making a face at me, but you can all see it we're on YouTube now. Uh <laughs> I've watched my husband play it. But the thing I remember most is how Yakuza was kind of introduced in the beginning and maybe that's kind of what turned me off for so long because they were like when the first run of the game came along they're like hey everyone this is uh this is grand theft auto <laughs> it's yeah, from japan yeah. and it is absolutely nothing like grand theft auto i'd love to talk to whoever made that marketing scheme and say yo what were you smoking but um i have as i said watched my husband and i've watched like a lot of like video and stuff like that and it, the thing i just admire most about it and the reason why 
the studio stands out to me at all is because um, in this genre, it is so rare, and this is something we complained about before, to have games that are actually based on adult problems that you mm -hmm. want to see adults go through. And I, of course, I did play uh, Like a Dragon, and I love that because um, it gives you an inside look into what it's like to be poor and homeless in Japan, because there are absolutely homeless, poor people in Japan, and, you know, people who can't get work, and people who, you know, have problems, and, you know, they, I guess it's kind of lightening it up to put them in an RPG situation, but it also really fit, like, it was just... It's, it walks a line, the series as a whole walks a line between comedy and drama that is very, very hard to walk. And I admire that about it very, very much. Yeah. Uh, just to go off of that, too, uh, I can't... It's, it's been... It's really weird that you've, you play the series... I have, like, we play the series for so long that you kind of forget that it does something so unique. And Because mm -hmm. every time the game comes out, like you know what to expect, and they deliver on pretty much what you expect which is a which is a great thing i think rgg is one of the most consistent uh studios because they, yes they, for sure they kind of make i don't want to say they make the same game but they they use the same foundation and then build upon that with each iteration but the the balance between uh like absurd absurdist humor and and melodrama is something i always mention whenever whenever i like talk to the talk about this game to new people because that's the pitch um that you're gonna get some of the most ridiculous out there comedy but then they bring it back down to earth with the more either whether it's Kiryu like learning a lesson or teaching someone a lesson or whether or not it's or if it's something that the thing that he's fighting for. Um, so you'll have these incredibly dramatic battles for like uh, like that, that that means so much to these characters. They're fighting for their life. And then next thing you know, he's uh, talking to uh, talking to a stripper about how she's doing like great work and she has to do what she has to do and he respects her and like things like that. It's like what what is going on? And then he like smash someone's face into the pavement and afterwards be like, you know what? Thank you for beating me up. I, I learned a lesson. I'm gonna be a better person now. And Kiryu's like, you know what? That's good for you. I'm very happy for you. <laughs> like what the hell is going on? There's even uh, just like these amazing visual jokes. Like I don't remember the name of the character. She's an NPC who wears that like 3D leopard shirt that yeah just yeah the Osaka stares granny. out at you that's the fantastic Osaka, yeah the Osaka and granny's always been there um but yeah it's uh i think it adds a lot of depth to kiryu's character even though if it's not in the in the main series because it's like oh i'm gonna go dancing i'm gonna go karaoke and then yeah that just becomes part of how you understand who he is and then the series likes to call back on things that fans really like um and you see it as the games go on they'll reference things like that the community is uh, a big fan of so and then yeah, it's almost like when Yakuza Like a Dragon, the RPG, came out in 2020. I reviewed it for GameSpot. I finished that game in like four days because I had to like crunch on a deadline. Wow, okay. uh, I was also reviewing the Xbox Series X at the same time. But uh, it felt like I fell in love with the series all over again for completely different reasons. And I mean, I'm, I'm sure we'll, we'll talk a little bit more. But uh, since Nadia brought it up, like the the whole idea of you know adults going through real life problems as an rpg is really wild actually and the thing about being poor and being an outcast in society the thing i still i remember one of the things i remember most about yakuza like a dragon is how being a different kind of asian in japan you're an outcast and mm -hmm. the way that game gave a nuanced take and painted that was was like nothing i've ever seen in uh, in a game story like especially like yakuza's which it always takes place in japan um but and you always use the the secret koreans and the the the, the chinese triads are always like the the secret villains at some point so having yakuza 7 flip that and show a very empathetic side of what it's like to be uh, a non-japanese person in japan was one of the strongest pieces of storytelling in that game uh, mm -hmm. Because like the Koreans and uh, the Chinese people who live in live in Japan, you know, they are outcasts. They're treated differently. They're seen as like second class citizens, and that's really like one of the huge things that that game is about. Um, and it's really cool to have party members who represent that and have these chapters and storylines where Ichiban is basically saying like, "Hey, man, it doesn't matter who you are. You can like I, I fuck with you. You're part of the party. You're you're my friend too." And then you go, like, they'll actually take you through what it's like to be different in Japan. And that's such a core part of that story. And I think Yakuza 7 is really, I felt like, 
not that they had to grow up or anything, not that they had any problems with that, but it felt like they took a next step in growing up in their storytelling to be like, yeah, we have this great story about Kiryu and all the things that he's been through, but now we're like integrating real world politics in a very real way into our main story for the series. Absolutely. I, I think back to my own start with RGG, which was with, on on a whim, I think I, I volunteered to freelance a review for Yakuza 0, having never played one of those games before. And I remember playing it and just being floored by the sense of place it has. Yeah. The, like, and, and not just place in terms of, obviously, Kamurocho is... A, a very defined place within the series and by the time that game came out it was a very defined place in the series and, and a lot of the appeal for longtime series fans was seeing it uh in a different time period but even then like the the time period the way they capture a specific moment in japan and and catalog it and go through even the story itself is wrapped into the era that was happening in japan as people were dealing with this big boom and the resulting spending and things like that. Um, it was really, really cool to see all of that play out the way it did around that, that empty lot and that plot. And I eventually like that, that just hooked me. I mean, I still say Yakuza zero is one of the best games of that generation. And, and I stick to that gun to this mm -hmm. day. And uh, I played Kiwami and, and some of Kiwami too. And, and I liked it from the, there on out, but I don't think it ever, hit for me quite the same even yakuza 6 didn't hit me quite the same uh as zero until yakuza like a dragon came around and it did just have so much of that heart back in there and also that sense of place and character and really just diving deep into what motivates the people that are doing the things they're doing i think the um the beat that stuck out for me from yakuza like a dragon was the entire bleach japan thing where mm -hmm. yeah. um it starts out you know talking a lot about the homeless people and other like issues in japan and then they float this idea of here's this party called bleach japan and they're gonna clean japan but clean means scrubbing people out of the margins yeah. essentially and you see how this group who in their eyes has good intentions of wanting to make a, a better japan a better like nation for their people is just trying to scrub away the people they don't like from the margins. And I thought that was an incredibly interesting and intriguing story to see RGG tackle and uh, do it with such like directness to say like, Hey, you can't just push people out because that doesn't solve any of the problems. You're just erasing the things you don't want to see. And, uh, and then they punch an excavator <laughs> because that's <laughs> that's those video games, you know. Um, that's how real people solve their problems. Oh my god! Because you you can't have dragons in a in a yakuza game, but you can't have excavators that 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 fight like dragons. Of course. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. the real like a dragon. I mean, is the the real best moment of every like a dragon game is when somebody takes their shirt off to reveal a back tattoo. That is mm -hmm. the best yeah. moment every time. And those right. tattoos are fucking badass. Just yeah. I, I'm a, I'm a white girl who probably shouldn't even think about it, but damn, I want a <laughs> tattoo on my back. Oh you just sit there, God. you're like, what if I got a giant? Ba Nadia, I feel like if you got a back tattoo, it would be of like a Final Fantasy summon, and not of like, uh, like like a traditional like like a dragon or or, Yo, or something like that. Like, what if you get got Bahamut? Yeah. What what I if like actually... the next? Yo. Just thinking about how for my uh, a tattoo, like if I ever got a sleeve, I'd get a dragon, but the uh, a Shenron from uh, oh. Dragon Ball, like just kind of wrapping mm. around my arm. I saw a really great version for uh, the that was made for the Year of a Dragon. So something like that I'd get in five seconds flat. Okay, if you commit to that, then I'll get one of Leviathan from Final Fantasy. Uh, yeah, let's... With, <laughs> with like a dragon We've already lance in the center of it. Oh, that's awesome. We've already committed yeah, to yeah. shirts that I won't talk about right now, but yeah, we've committed oh, to shirts. So we may as well commit. Yeah, that got that got shipped. Eric, did you did you chicken out? I'll kill no, you. No, no, I've got out. no, I've got the shirt. No, we're doing the bit. Okay. Don't worry. We're doing the bit. <laughs> okay. I don't okay. know where it is. They said it shipped, but it hasn't shown up yet, but we are doing oh, the bit. Mine. Pax East. Okay, look good. forward to it. <laughs> we can we talk about it now that Cat's not here. We are doing a bit at Pax East. Um, 
base prefect brings up uh you could also get alexander and that would be a really sick be a back oh. can you imagine if like a, a yakuza character ripped off their shirt and had alexander alexander oh that'd be so sick that'd be so confusing but so badass <laughs> They're like, whoa, hold on, hold on. What is that? What do you mean, what is that? Seeking it's Alexander. The, piece of <laughs> <laughs> the music starts playing. Soken's just yelling <laughs> on a microphone and all that. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, Damn. Okay, so we've talked a lot about the Yakuza series. Let's talk specifically about Like a Dragon, which is where I think the series goes from being action games that do have RPG elements, you know, things like. That, that obviously also have, you know, one foot in the side of action games, but the other foot in the side of Shenmue, much like Shenmue did, of mm-hmm. here's all this stuff where you're going around town, you're talking to NPCs, you're you're playing a role in a very traditional sense, even if the game is playing much more like a third-person action game. Uh, there is a lot of RPG ideas in there. Uh, but Yakuza Like a Dragon takes it and just says... We're doing Dragon Quest now. We're doing Dragon yeah. Quest in <laughs> roughly modern day Japan uh, with a forty year old uh, ex con who used to who grew up in a soap land playing the original Dragon Quest games. Uh, I mean, we've we've talked a lot about Yakuza Like a Dragon on here. Uh, it's been a frequent game that comes up, and I think we we all broadly agree that that's a good video game. Oh yes. Yeah, it's a it superb has video game. its problems for sure, but yes, yeah. like if nothing else, the characters are absolutely fantastic. Yeah. So, what do we think then? Is like, like, do we think that the Yakuza series as a whole can count as an RPG? We're playing the is it an RPG game? Do we think <laughs> that the Yakuza series counts as an RPG, or did it really only convert over to RPG once it made the switch to the Dragon Quest style of uh, like a dragon? Uh, I mean, I would say, uh, like, I I never really, it, like, the series always had RPG elements, but I never thought of it as an yeah. RPG, I guess. Uh, but now with, with Seven and now Infinite Wealth, it's like, that is, it feels like the series can be whatever it wants to be at this point. Yeah. Um, and it has definitely, um, RGG has definitely staked a claim in the RPG space. Like it's they definitely are, R- RPG yeah. adjacent, at least. Yeah. Um, but with Seven and Infinite Wealth, uh, they are definitely they are, I would say, a major player in the RPG space now. Like, um, I mean, we'll see when uh, what the reception is like when Infinite Wealth comes out. But based on the demo uh, that you get after finishing Gaiden, like, it feels like they have figured out the systems of what it what you want out of an RPG. Because like, Yakuza Seven, like a dragon, like they um. You could tell it was their first attempt at making this kind of game, you know. Uh, the idea was definitely there, and it was certainly a ton of fun, and the systems worked really well for what they what they needed them to uh, to do. But you could tell that, like, oh, what if you just, like, do... If they could just do this, if they could just do that, if they can uh, add a little bit more complexity here, give you an op- uh, option to do something else, like this, uh, like, in combat. Like, moving around is... Like, having your defined space, like, a tactical RPG... Is does works wonders for that system. Like you think of it as like yeah. maybe it's not that big of a deal, but I wish I could have that. But the things that you're it allows you to do the the doors it opens up by just being able to move your character on their turn. It it, it opens up all kinds of tactical possibilities in that in the game. And like when you play the demo for uh, Infinite Wealth, you you see that right away because they give you uh, four p- party members. They give you uh, like. Uh, a lot of the job skills that come along with them. So you can already start to piece together like, okay, this character, I could position them there, get a back attack, bounce the bounce that enemy into my other party member. So it does, I play a lot of RPGs and, you know, they're, they're definitely working off of the back of games that have come before. But from the Infinite Wealth demo, I can tell is that they are starting to take ownership of how they build their RPGs. They're no longer trying to emulate what dragon quest does or what anything yeah. else came, came before they're like yeah we we did that for the first time as like not not a test run but you know we we need to put something out there and then like iterate on it next time it feels like now they're like okay this is our system now now we are doing things that are uniquely ours um so they are uh they're definitely 
part of the RPG players now. You know, still the the youngins, I guess you could say, in those that particular style of game. But all eyes are on them now when they're making an RPG. Absolutely, I think, like like you were saying, the demo for Infinite Wealth really sets out a good snapshot of how that studio has grown from one game to the next. And one thing that we we probably should have mentioned a little bit more is that Negoshi obviously left in a uh, in 2021. Uh, mm. So you have this this kind of lingering question of how is the new team going to handle making uh, new RGG games moving forward? And we've already had two examples in uh, Ishin and Gaiden about how they would make an action style game, a more uh, yeah. Kiryu centric game, but. Uh, with Ichiban taking back, you know, infinite wealth and and going back to a turn-based RPG, uh, as certain high-profile streamers were very surprised by. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe we don't talk about, but it's still just the strangest thing in the world. Uh, but it, I, I was really curious to see what do they learn from that. Obviously, they were out there publicly saying, you know, you get to move on your turn now, which was a huge thing from Yakuza Like a Dragon, right? Being yeah. able to control how those characters move instead of just hoping that they shuffle close enough for the AoEs yeah. to hit and things like that. Uh, so uh, having a lot more control over things is is one really good notion that they are reacting. But like you said, there's just so much in these systems that really does feel like they have laid out a groundwork broadly inspired by the things that came before it. And I guess the the second question I'm going to pose is, do we now feel like RGG is developing their own RPG and not just kind of building on inspirations that came before it? Um, I would venture to say that was always the case, that they were always building their own thing, because yes, the Dragon Quest reference is uh, very obvious, and it just struck me that... Uh, we had the main character as an orphan, even though, like, uh, they didn't grow up in a, a town, quote-unquote, more of a, uh, you know, brothel. But, uh, yeah, it just feels like that was almost secondary to the original game, which was so, like, wacky and weird. And, I mean, there aren't many games where you're going to punch out a bulldozer or, or try to punch out a bulldozer. So, <laughs> to me, that stands out more clearly as, okay, um, this is its own thing versus a real, quote-unquote, real RPG. And, of course, so I, I expect, like, a big step up to the second game in terms of quality because yeah. they're really kind of like okay now we know what to do we're gonna go for it seize yeah. the day oh i i really like how you put that because like yeah i guess it, it goes back to the thing of like i played so many of these games that i kind of almost expect those sorts of things but yeah. you, you take a step back and like yeah the, the 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 rpg systems are a little um you know fairly basic for yakuza 7 um but the things that they're doing that are uniquely them I imagine like people are jumping into the first time like yo what the fuck is this game why are am i beating up clowns and bulldozers and big buff dudes with their shirts off all at the same time and it's it's like the the context around the rpg systems are what make it so mm -hmm. unique and it's its own thing like you can have these big fantasy stories or like these big sci-fi stories um but no one else is is doing what they're doing and uh yeah it's uh it's just it's a different way to engage with that world and i it, the rpg systems almost you know the thing too is yakuza games have always been about this lone wolf who will fight the entire yakuza on his own you are going to beat up a hundred menacing men to get to the big bad boss before he has to cut his finger off because he feels shame by being beat up by this young Kiryu as 20 years old in Yakuza Zero, like, and then he's always fighting through Millennium Tower and he's going to beat up his, his best friend or, <laughs> or his biggest rival at the, at the tippy top of Millennium Tower. Because it's such a great set piece. Oh it's like, you know, it's, a it's like a mountain, you know, Millennium you don't need a mountain, tower. you need a castle, you have the tower. The Millennium Tower has got to be like, I feel like that needs to be like a national, uh, like monument, a national park. Even though it yeah. doesn't really exist, like here's where all the it. anime takes place. We should, we <laughs> should build it. Yeah, we should build it and then make it like a sacred, sacred ground. Um, uh, but yeah, it's uh, and then so when Seven came around, it's uh, they can bring like that. That's the thing. RGG's character work, their character development has always been their biggest strength. I think. Yeah. And then when they do that for four or six, seven other party members, in a, in their first attempt at an RPG, so it's not even just like the combat too. It's how do you weave these characters into a story 
and RGG's character work has been like some of the best ever in video games. And now they're doing it for everyone in a party. And they're using yeah. the the party dynamic to build up its new character. So the thing is, this, he's no longer a lone wolf. Our main character has the power of friendship. And that's the thing I fucking love most. That was my my uh, my strap line for my uh, review for Yakuza 7, was the power of friendship. Because that is what that game is about. But you're not able to do that unless you build up the characters in that party properly. And right. that is, they were, I would say, almost flawless in terms of how they built that party. Um, the way they rally, rally around each other, the way there's like drama within that group and how that plays out. Um, it's exactly RGG's style of storytelling now expanded in an RPG context. So, uh, you know, Kiryu is always going to be a legend. There's there's no, like, he's always going to be like one of my top favorite characters of, of all time. Nothing's ever going to change that. But Ichiban shot up the charts immediately after one game because yeah. of how they were able to build... Uh, build a story around him and build supporting characters that uplift him as well. And so that is the other half of the RP RPG equation uh, is the character work and the character development and all the things you do around the combat system. So in that regard, yes, like RG, they, they at their first attempt had done characters better than almost other, uh, so many other RPGs that I've played over the years. Like they are unmatched just from seven alone they are unmatched in how they develop their characters and that is kind of what makes playing that rpg rewarding and worth it so it's my crew right there you know what i'm saying i absolutely no, man. i just think it's incredible though like we have so many rpgs that delve into fantasy sci-fi all that sort of thing but the way that yakuza like a dragon does the modern world and mm -hmm. granted it is a at times fantasized version of the modern world, but it still tells modern stories about people like, like everyday people and the struggles that they face, the issues they run into it does make them intensely relatable, but also in its own way makes Yakuza feel like a different story from everything else out there. You know, mm -hmm. you look at, we, we talked earlier about GTA in Japan, right? And, and, and how that was kind of the framing of Yakuza for forever. And I think yeah. it partially probably was because it was, here's a like crime story set in Japan because Grand Theft Auto was really the only other kind of game that was doing that sort of stuff where you follow someone deep in the, the criminal underground, working in the shadows, like, like doing crime and getting caught up in all this mess because RPGs rarely ever broach that subject matter. Even when they get into like war stories, the war stories tend to be wrapped in in fantasy or sci-fi or an alt version of World War II where Valkyries can unleash laser beams and things like that. <laughs> right. um, but Yakuza is so rare for that. And, and granted, like I'm not, I, I'm not washing over the parts of that series that are just exaggerated to an extreme degree mm -hmm. to a point where it's okay now this character is summoning a bunch of other characters through their cell phone to deliver poundings via doordash and all that but uh i i think that is what makes the series really compelling from an rpg standpoint is not just that it's a good rpg not just that it tells a different uh kind of story but that tells a story that really no other rpg is telling that mm -hmm. that it's it's doing something that you don't see often in the space uh another question i'm going to pose to y'all do we think that rgg is becoming an rpg studio of note do we think that this is when we start talking about we've already had a couple topics already from the the end of last year and the start of this one we talk about who's who's the big studios we did the power rankings last week you know who's mm -hmm. who's one to watch and there were already people saying RGG Studio should be in the the top 5 power ranking the the preseason ranking of yeah, 2024 yeah. <laughs> yeah uh do we think that's valid do we think RGG has earned that spot or do you think it's still kind of too early to call uh, I think I think they're at least starting to earn it. I think that even though in my head, uh, I mean, I, I still may not think like Yakuza equals RPG like immediately as solidly as I think like you know RPG equals Dragon Quest or Final Fantasy. But mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. uh, they are certainly getting to that point. They've always been, as I said, RPG adjacent because um, I tend to be the kind of person who associates RPGs with a lot of good storytelling, a lot of you know character development, a lot of like camaraderie. Is it camaraderie or is it? Yeah, sure. Uh, or camaraderie, so, as I've seen it spelled sometimes. It weirds me out. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that to me equals like they know the basics of what makes a great rpg and like once they kind of buff up their gameplay which they are uh they can very easily have a shot at, at in the, the the pantheon so to speak yeah uh i think the way you put it eric uh, as like power rankings because you know <laughs> we love sports so i always find uh the the idea of power rankings really interesting because it, it's basically like who's trending upwards um and RGG is 1,000% trending upwards. And so I would also say that um, even though they are relatively new to creating RPGs, they have shot up the ranks of like studios that people get excited about for their next game and for yeah, their next sure. RPG. And I think, you know, I don't, I don't want to put too much weight into like TGA's most anticipated award or whatever, but I think that's indicative of what people think of them, right? So... The fact that they were, I mean, it's one of the few games that we actually knew were, were, were going to come out in the following year. So that's probably also why they were able to be nominated for Most Anticipated in 2023. But I think the the level of anticip anticipation that I'm seeing behind Infinite Wealth, and I think it's also like yeah. they're just pouring a lot of fucking marketing money into this game for sure. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the level in which I've seen a lot of people on board, like even from like when I covered this game on GameSpot, it is getting views in a way Yakuza games have not historically. Like, I've been covering the series since since I started playing it in 2017. And then there's always kind of a, been, a, been a bit of a struggle to convince, uh, like, people above me that we should be covering this game because they're like, ah, you know, it's it's a bit, uh, it's not niche, but, you know, it's it still has a dedicated fan base, not as big. Like, we should cover the next Call of Duty instead of dedicating time to covering Yakuza. I'm like, should. man, fuck y'all. Um it's but now it's yeah. Now it's gone to the point where oh, this is a game we're good. We are going to dedicate coverage to, and like the tone has shifted so drastically in the years since I've started playing the series. Uh, and Infinite Wealth is the the biggest I have seen this franchise. Whether that's just like the marketing push, the actual excitement behind people who want to play this game, um, you know, it's uh, that's all indicative of how much the series has grown. And then so they have shot up the power rankings. Like, I would st still say, like, there are other, stu other studios, renowned studios, who I think are doing uh, turn-based RPGs extremely well. I mean, like, Square Enix, the various teams at Square Enix with Octopath Traveler, I still think that that is, like, one of the best turn-based RPGs, like, ever. Mm -hmm. And it mm -hmm. is, like, a it is because it is an evolution of turn-based games. Like, they're not, it's not stuck in time or whatever. And, like, you still have you know, Dragon Quest as, like, the big players in turn-based RPGs. But the fact that RGG can put out a turn-based game and have this level of excitement, this level of notoriety behind that kind of system that I think over time people have, like, turned a, like, a like a kind of side-eye in a way, I guess. Not me, I fucking love these games. Like, Persona, Shin Megami Tensei, and then you have Yakuza Like a Dragon, like, or, like, the Like a Dragon series. Like, these are the big players alongside Dragon Quests. And a lot of the other things that Square Enix does, they are a part of that conversation now. So they are in the power, high in the power rankings. I would say. I like that comparison point because I do. <laughs> shout outs to a friend of the show, Kenneth Shepard. We've had many discussions about you know how does the Yakuza slash like a Dragon series match up to something like a Persona? Because mm -hmm. uh, I do personally think that they are reaching the point where they're on the same scale, especially for mm -hmm. people who aren't into RPGs. I think if you're into RPGs, you're still probably going to be like yelling at me through the screen right now. Like persona, it's just personas. The great, like, I, I know, I know, I know. Um, <laughs> please, please, uh, DM cat. Don't DM me. <laughs> Air phone's going to blow up. <laughs> it's just like, just tell cat. Give it to cat. Cat's over in Iceland is like, Oh my God. <laughs> now, I'm, now I'm getting texts about persona. What the hell? What's happening? Uh, <laughs> power rankings uh <laughs> but I, I think persona is a series that had a breakthrough moment with persona 5 i think a lot of 
uh, eyes are on Yakuza to see whether it breaks through. And, and to be clear, breakthrough, I mean, like, hits the mainstream. It's the same thing that, that Fire Emblem had, arguably both with Awakening, which is being speedrun right now, and Game's Done Quick, by the way. Shout out to GDQ. Um, both with Awakening and even more so, I would say, with Three Houses, where mm-hmm. now, rather than just the people that are already interested in these games or paying attention, now you have this broader... Uh, appeal to it you this this sense that even people who might not normally be paying attention to people who don't even listen to this podcast might know what yuck mm-hmm. like a dragon is or be paying attention to rgg's stuff and i do feel like the yakuza series if zero wasn't already a breakthrough and i think zero was just the breakthrough to get the west more widely aware of that series and and like a dragon also did that but it does feel like infinite wealth is getting a huge push a a press to say this is now that tier of video game for for Sega Atlas, and it's kind of wild to think about the fact that you know we normally associate Square Enix as as like one of you know, when we did our power rankings, one of the top dogs in the RPG you know standings. Even despite you know I think people having varying opinions on things like Forspoken and Final Fantasy sixteen, uh, Square Enix is still obviously clear in a way a top dog, but Atlas is right there and now like the sega side of that equation has a front runner rising up too and it's interesting to see some of the rpg power balance shifting and i think that's ultimately a good thing i like that and and i like that this series is doing that so will will the power shift i mean well, what do we hope for the future of rgg i personally hope they just keep making more turn-based rpgs i would love <laughs> to see them just keep doing this and i i love the action games too i thought gaiden was pretty good uh i had a lot of fun with ishin as well uh, i still think the way they make action games is really fun and i'd love to see them judgments in kind of a weird place where i never know yeah. if that series is going to continue or not yeah but even if they come out with a new action ip at some point uh I'd probably be there for it, but I do really want to see them continue to develop turn-based RPGs, especially with Ichiban at the four. Is that kind of where y'all yeah. are too? Yeah. Yeah. Pretty yeah. much. I mean, uh, like you said, you, it can't hurt for sure. Like I like the idea of other RPG makers just kind of looking at the way they're telling stories and using adult characters and maybe mm-hmm. someone will get some ideas and say, Hey, I could do that too. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, I think the same thing too. Uh, so the thing with Gaiden is, uh, I, in my review, I was like, Gaiden feels like the biggest. I mean, it, it's it's not like huge, but it felt like a really a, like a, a significant step forward in how they build action games. Like Lost, I still think like Lost Judgment is my favorite action combat system that they made. Uh, but the the way that they integrated like the agent style in Gaiden for a relatively short game, it feels like they did a significant amount of work to make that uh, combat system uh, all the more exciting. So I hope that they kind of do, they do a leapfrog uh, thing where there's like, okay, we'll do one action game, then we'll do the RPG, then we'll do an action yeah. game, then like so alternating between the two styles of games, which they've kind of basically been doing since they've had uh, Yakuza 7. So I hope that they keep doing that. And um, yeah, for the turn-based combat, so like, yeah, absolutely. They, they, they should... Uh, keep keep going in that direction it's like you know they, they're known for their action games but they're also they have they've broken through in the, in the rpg space so i hope that they would have room to do both um and i, I don't think i don't think judgment is coming back uh by the way so no so, how come uh, did it sell badly like i don't know for sure i don't uh, actually i mean I don't think it's sold badly, but I just don't think it was uh, necessarily uh, like a breakthrough that they were expecting. And also just the just the hold up with uh, uh, Takuya Kimura being the likeness of uh, Yagami. Oh, Unless they like build up a, like a right. new protagonist with like similar characters. Like they did the Kaito Files, which was about Masahiro Kaito, which is who's a very good character. Um, but unless they build someone up to take up that mantle, I don't think that they're going to uh, return to that series so long as the likeness of Yagami is held up. I completely forgot about that. Yeah, yeah. that's a whole thing. Yeah, I that's do, a whole thing. I do love the idea of them delving into the detective side of things and, and maybe some more mystery because I think that just fits yeah. very well with their like kind of crime world um, universe that they have. Yeah, it's, it's of, a different of, side of it. Yeah. Yeah. 
But uh, like you said, I feel like the one thing that is always a little bit weird about like a dragon is that obviously they love to have real people in their games, whether that be through the FMV sequences that they have or through the uh, the celebrities that they have do likenesses and, and voice acting. And I do feel like that can be a double-edged sword at yeah. times, as we saw with Lost Judgment. So uh, We also saw that. what Judgment Judgment. Do you remember that? <laughs> oh, my gosh. The, yes. <laughs> the, the cocaine incident. That yeah. shit was <laughs> wild. Because, yo, okay, so quick story. Uh, my homegirl, she went to Japan, uh, like, so it, because Judge Eyes, which was the, the, the English translation of the Japanese version, the Japanese, this was still when they didn't do simultaneous release, or they were still working on simul release. So the game was already out in Japan, and it was being localized, and it was going to come out like six or eight months later here in the West. But So in, in, there's a space in between where the game was not out uh, here mm-hmm. in the West. That's when the cocaine incident happened with uh, one of the so one of the actors who lent their likeness and voice to one of the one of the characters in the game got caught in a scandal because we got caught with drugs and in Japan if you it's like a huge mark of shame like if I don't know a CEO of a company gets caught doing coke whatever of course they're doing coke like no one gives yes. a shit uh, but if you get caught in Japan like that is a huge mark of shame you will never be seen in the public eye ever again. So we got caught with that, and they had to pull the game uh, from store shelves and then scramble to find a new uh, actor likeness and voice. Or I think this was... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so they had to do that, uh, especially for the Western release in time. But there was a period, so my homegirl went to Japan, and I was like, yo, if you see an original copy of Judge Eyes, try to get that for me. She went to a store, she saw it, and she's like, yo, there's a copy here. Uh, and then she asked the clerk. It was behind a desk. Is like, yo, can I buy that? And they're like, no, we can't sell that. And I'm like, yo, that is wild. There's a, there is a $1,000 copy of Judgment somewhere, the Japanese version with the original actor and voice. Like, I want that. God damn it. Wow. I, well, and uh, they can, yeah. were they not allowed to sell it? Or it's just yeah. like, no, I'm keeping this for myself. Oh, I don't, I don't know, actually. Uh, who knows? Uh, I, I did Google just to make sure that we were getting all the facts. We, we did get all the facts correct. But uh, it turns out that if you Google that in a way, you will also get results of, does cocaine affect your judgment? <laughs> I mean, it's not great. <laughs> I, I wouldn't RGD's advise like, it. yes, it does. <laughs> it affected our entire judgment <laughs> release. Uh. On that note, that is the RGG dev quest. We are, of course, going to talk about like a dragon infinite wealth very very soon that game comes out very very soon after the release of this episode in fact so we will have an episode coming up talking about infinite wealth we will even potentially have people on who've played quite a wealth of infinite wealth to talk about it uh it should hey. be a good time but that's it for the dev quest if you have any more stuff you want us to talk about if you have other studios you want us to dev quest reach out hit us up on the social medias and all that uh you can talk to us on the patreon Twitter uh, slash Blood God Pod, all of that. Uh, DevQuest is something that I think we're, we're figuring out where it's going to fit, whether we're going to do more specials or whether it's going to fold into show topics or not. But it is something that we do love to do, especially as a studio is prepping to do a big release like RGG is. And now it's time for a series of random encounters. Square Enix president Takashi Kiryu believes the company needs to diversify its gaming output. Hopefully that means we're not losing out on a Dio field too. <laughs> Hundreds of <Wow>. developers <laughs> respond to a GDC survey saying they're working on projects for the Nintendo Switch's successor. Ubisoft's director of subscription says consumers need to be comfortable with not owning their game. Meanwhile, Larian Svenvinke says the studio's games will never be on subscription services. <laughs> and layoffs uh. hit Behavior Interactive, CI Games, and Thunderful Group, keeping the layoff trend from 2023 rolling into 2020. 24. Our thoughts with all those who have lost their jobs in what is a really tough time for game development. I haven't even heard right about the Thunderful uh, layoffs. Mm-hmm. Like, didn't they just release a game? They just released Steam World uh, Build, didn't they? Yeah, under the Thunderful the right group? group. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's a shame. Um, but for our longer encounter today, our mid boss, if you will, uh, the <laughs> Xbox Developer Direct just happened, and we got two different pieces of RPG news. 
Uh, let's talk real quick about Avowed. How did we feel about the Avowed gameplay? I feel like I watched it and it was exactly what I expected it to be in both good and bad ways of just being like, that is a first person fantasy RPG. That is mm-hmm. <laughs> what that is what I thought it was going to look like. Yep. Um, which I'm not going to say is a negative, but I'm also going to say it did not surprise me in any way. Nadia, mm-hmm. how did you feel about Avowed? Exactly the same as you did. Uh, in fact, I was watching Kyle Bosman and his kind of review overview of the um, Xbox showcase, and he said, "Dudes, Baldur's Gate Three is right there." And he's like, kind of like pointing out the uh, the choice that you're making in the game. Something about some guy who betrayed yeah. someone or other, and he's just like, "I don't really care that much about this." Like, it is going to be hard for them to follow up on Baldur's Gate Three. But on the other hand, as you say, it's good and bad. Like, I can't really say I object to the idea of like having a more polished Skyrim experience and here and. Uh, the year of 2024. So it's just very eh, middle of the road. If it's tr- if it's on Game Pass, sure, why the hell not? Um, the thing I would say is that the the th- the thing with Obsidian is uh, it's it's ne- never necessarily the combat that excites me about an Obsidian game. I mm. mean, like, well, there's Pillars of Eternity. They do Poe, right? Yes. Yes. Okay, I get I get Pillars of Eternity and the other Poe game. What's the other Path Poe of Exile. game? I get those things confused all the time. Um, I can't remember which one Obsidian does, uh, but uh, Avowed, like, like, like you said, like the first person combat isn't the thing that's going to excite me about an Obsidian game. It's like the world building, the writing, the character work that they do. Right, um, that's fair. Yeah, and the way that I interact with that world and the way they do choice choices in their RPGs is always probably one of the more fascinating things about their games. I mean, Outer Worlds. Uh, I, there are things I really liked about Outer Worlds, but I do not. I don't think it was like their strongest game by any stretch. Um, but I mean, historically, I feel like you know, Obsidian as a studio, a lot of people work on these games, obviously. But Obsidian's like bread and butter is never necessarily the combat stuff. So I'm still, uh, you know, I'm still excited just to see keeping the, that the, hope alive. Yeah, so. yeah. I always think about how much I liked Pentiment. It was such a like That's good true. game and a very it showed Obsidian strengths, but in a very new light. And I I'm willing to give them some benefit of the doubt. Like you said, I think it's weird they did a combat showcase for this game because yeah. unless you're doing something radically different. And granted, they did have like dual wielding wands and stuff like that, but <laughs> I I don't think a first person RPG necessarily demos well all the time especially if it's a fantasy Mm -hmm. one where a lot of the things you're doing are like blocking and then swinging an axe and and i think i saw someone compare it to a vr game and i was like yeah 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 yeah." Yeah. especially with like all the asgard's wrath footage that was going around recently it was hard not to like see similar comparisons and i will say that the cover art the, the the artwork that they put out for avowed like that alone was more interesting to me than a lot of the stuff I saw in it's nice the cover game. art. Oh, mm, yeah. that was nice. Gorgeous. Gorgeous, yeah. gorgeous. Um so I I don't know. I I am willing to give Obsidian some benefit of the doubt to say like, "Hey, y'all are making kind of your version of the Elder Scrolls but set within the Pillars of Eternity universe and kind of doing your own spin on things. I'm willing to see what this is and check it out." But I, I'll definitely say that while it didn't dissuade me from the game, it also didn't make me any more interested in the game than I already was. So that is what it is. I, I saw I, it. It exists. I will see more of it as it nears a release date, I imagine. But uh, we also saw Visions of Mana. And I wanted to bring this up because I it kind of made me realize what I have felt in my gut for a long time, which is... For a long time now, Square has always kind of been the place, or Square, sorry, um, PlayStation has been the place where a lot of places like Square put a lot of big RPGs, right? You you have Sony keeping that Final Fantasy 16 and that 7 locked to the PlayStation. It's PlayStation is yeah. where you want to play Final Fantasy. Uh, even 14, now that's changing, but 14 for the longest time was only on PC and PlayStation. But meanwhile, while while Sony's doing that and they're locking down Square Enix, they're saying Square Enix and us, nothing getting between us. (laughs) Xbox over here was putting Bandai Namco on a stage and saying, hey, announce Tales of Vesperia at an Xbox showcase. They were getting a bunch of Persona games onto Game Pass. They were getting a bunch of Yakuza games 
onto Game Pass, and now they have Visions of Mana in an Xbox Developer Direct, something that has otherwise been completely set aside for a lot of Xbox game studios. They say Square Enix, Mana Team, come through, show off, talk about your game a little bit, announce the release window. Uh, Xbox is is getting in on on the RPG front, the Japan RPG development scene specifically, and... I, I was just sitting there. I was like, I'm taking notice of this. I, mm-hmm. I I see this happening. This is interesting. Yeah. I'm very happy for it, but at the same time, I'm terrified that it means like Microsoft is planning to buy Square. I do not want that to happen <laughs> in any any observable universe. I I don't I don't know. I would be. I'm not going to rule it out because, frankly, after the Activision Blizzard announcement, you just can't guess what the next move is. But you really uh, can't. Never let them know your next but move. At, at the same time, I would be utterly dumbfounded if i woke up tomorrow and it was like microsoft's buying square enix i'd be like nothing surprises that me that would anymore. that would not that would surprise i don't me. think that square enix would, would agree me. to that yeah like, they, they have too much stake in being uh on other platforms still so that's true yeah but uh yeah this is a mana like as a deeply wounded mana fan who's basically been <laughs> waiting for a game that really you know moved her as much as the first game did this looks really good. This looks really promising. And as long the, the problem I've always had with Mana sequels, it's always like, hey, here's Mana. It looks great. It sounds great. Uh, we're going to put some weird mechanic in there that if you're just someone who wants to hit things with a sword, you can go F yourself because it's not, you know, <laughs> we're going to do something weird here instead. So this looks like not only like a straightforward, good action RPG, like Trials of Mana 3D was obviously the precursor to this. And that was a good game. So this will hopefully be even better. And it looks so mana Oh, that's so mana. That's so Raven. <laughs> that I can't help but be excited because you have like the original character designer on there saying like, yeah, here are the characters that I, I even had no idea that, that this was true. But he's like, yeah, I designed them when I was like a, a schoolboy, like doodling these monsters and just seeing like the classic, like I can name all the enemies that we saw in that trailer. Like, yeah, like the Rabbite, the the Lullabud, the... Um, he had like a, a stuffed flammy toy behind him that I just wanted to break into the screen and grab and pull out because <laughs> my god, that thing was glorious. I am very much looking forward to Mana. Definitely one of my most anticipated of this year. Uh, please don't blow it square. I'll, I, I'm an old person. I need my youthful energy back. I need that youthful injection of hope and dreams. Please deliver. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm I'm really excited to see this. I do think that it is... It feels like a throwback in a lot of really good ways. I just look at it and see, like, okay, they clearly took the Trials of Mana remake and said, we learned some good lessons from this. You know, we made a 3D Mana game built on the foundation of, you know, an all-time classic for us, uh, for Square. And now we're going to build something new and we're going to do something with it, but it still has a lot of that charm, like so much of that charm. Even... Uh, people in my my work Slack at the time who are not huge Mana fans would probably not know Mana from the jump. We're looking at the art, even just the art of Secret of Mana and stuff like that is is stunning to this day. And Absolutely. to see the art style replicated in 3D and just look so classic. Like, it's going to be a really good year, I think, for action RPGs because yeah. I know last year we had 16 and, and, and all that, but this year we're going to have Visions of Mana. We're probably going to get the Yeez 10 uh port here and lord knows like the ease fans are yeah. always hungry for that stuff i we could have a good year ahead for yield action rpgs uh which would be really exciting. i am ready i am ready and as for ease 10 i really hope that comes out this year as a translation because translations are so slow with falcom it makes me sad mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. i just want to play Ease the Vinland Saga really bad, you know? Wow. Ease Vikings. <laughs> I loved yeah. Ease 9, which is Batman. Just, da, 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 I'm Christian Adol. It was great. <laughs> oh, that's going to oh, do Adol it. Oh, Adol Christian, sorry. That's going to do it for our longer encounters, and we're going to roll into the tavern now and talk about what we've been playing. Michael Hyam, you got anything you can talk about that you've been playing? No, there is nothing I can talk about nothing that I've been playing. Fantastic. Look, that's what I wanted to ask first. <laughs> yep. Good job. Uh, Nadia, what about yourself? Uh, well, I also had a game that I pumped a bunch of hours into that I cannot talk about, but I can talk about, uh, let's see, I am still playing Dragon Quest Monsters, uh, what's the Dark Prince, 
mm-hmm. which is a great game. The only thing that disappoints me about it is, uh, number one, regular Switch problems, which aren't even that bad. And uh, number two, I feel like the story could be a little bit beefier because it has some really great subject matter. Like you're playing as the villain of Dragon Quest IV and you can see where everything went wrong for him. Uh, so far, it's fine in terms of storytelling. Great voice acting. I'm glad they put so much like quality voice acting into what's basically a B-tier game. So that's pretty awesome. Uh, also played the... God, for all three of us, this is the end of Endwalker. It's all done. It's gone. It is oh, finished. Yeah. It is on a... It, there is a bow. We to, are on the to ship to the new world. Yeah, I need to catch up too. Yeah. I'm, I'm oh, well, I won't say anything. But um, yeah. female hmm. Hrothgar. Yeah. I did. I did see that the the female Hrothgar has been added to fourteen. Which shout outs to everyone who has been holding out for that for ages. Uh, you know, I love that for them. Yeah, I need mm-hmm. to catch up on fourteen. I think I'm still in patch like early patch six point five. I need to to wrap oh, it up. Yeah. So uh, we are now at the point where we are just the the stage is set for Dawn Trail. Uh, mm-hmm. and I need to get back in there and check that stuff out. We're going to eat so much food. <laughs> I have been yeah. playing a little video game you might have heard about oh, this weekend God. as of the live recording and even into the, the new week. I have been playing Pal World. Uh, oh, oh, boy. Please tell me about Pal World. So Pal World is, I mean, so I talked about this in, in an impressions piece that I did with, with one Zoe Hanley uh, over on uh, in which... It was one of those games, kind of like Doke V or Craftopia or stuff like that, where you would just see it during a live show or a live stream, and it would just be like, oh, hey, it's that Pokemon with guns game, and that yeah. was it. That was kind of where like the, the thought train stopped. You're like, oh, I hope that's not a scam, and, <laughs> and uh, even the developers were out there ahead of launch saying, we are not a scam. This, this is not a... You know, <laughs> it may look like one, but it's not. Yeah, this may look like we are trying to take your money and run, but we are not. Uh, and so when when we had the opportunity to get some early access for it and start playing it, I was like, ah, oh, you know, just, I'm busy right now, but I'll try it. I My curiosity got the better of me. This is not the game that you might think it is. Because I've I, th- heard. I think a lot of people looked at it and thought, oh, it's Pokemon with guns. And that's kind of right but also not all the way right it's really more like arc with pokemon if if you've played arc mm, or rust yeah. or valheim those sorts of games it is a open world survival game where you are punching trees to get wood and punching rocks to get stone and then building different facilities and establishing a base and exploring the world but also, it's like, what if that had Pokemon Legends Arceus in it, where there are just kind of these adorable, legally distinct knockoff monsters walking around? And there's been a lot of discourse about how yeah. distinct or not distinct these are. And I think there are a few that I've seen already that feel, you know, it's it's one thing to say, hey, we're going to take meganium and make like our version of meganium and there's like parody law that you could kind of get into there uh and also like look i I love pokemon i really do i need to preface what i'm about to say with i do love pokemon (laughs) i I know what you're gonna say i own pokemon cards here okay that are sitting on my desk um Game Freak is not always the most original with their designs either. There's like 14 Pikachus in that game now. <laughs> like, we've seen Electric Mouse a dozen times over. So, um, with that though. being said, there are a few that are pretty egregious to the point that I, I, I think all eyes are on Game Freak as to how they're going to respond to do some of the stuff that's in Pal World. But there's also a Totoro, like just a straight up Totoro. Oh yeah, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, an Electric Totoro. Electric Totoro, yeah, the mascot. There's there's a lot of places where it's almost like a Nathan for you type thing of well we could do parody <laughs> Pokemon and get away <laughs> with it, uh, and all that is to say, it's not a bad game. It's not great. I, right. I think it's not it's not a greatness yet. I mean, granted, it's an early access game. It just came out. Yeah. I think there's a lot of very fast heated reactions to this game because it is blowing up the steam charts i know every it's it's kind of the start of the year to give you like some inside baseball about the industry like this is normally a very quiet time for the industry so 
the second you see a game that takes off the way that pal world does every single person is going to jump on it whether you're a -hmm. streamer that needs a new game to play that's the new hotness or whether you're a media person that's like oh a lot of people are looking for pal world stuff right now so we got to like be on pal world coverage or you're just a person who plays games and there's like no big games have really come out yet you might still be working on your backlog but like everyone's kind of weak to the fomo in that regard and they'll see something like oh everyone's playing pal worlds i should be playing pal world too uh so i'm curious whether this has that level of staying power because you have history so much history of games that kind of come and go and and show up and take take the world by storm and then immediately kind of fall by the wayside you know three weeks six weeks later that goes mm-hmm. double for like anything pokemon like inspired what happened to tem world like everyone was saying oh this is it Tem-tem. this is, this is oh, the Tem-tem. pokemon killer tem tem yeah. sorry yeah, yeah i Tem-tem. mean there Tem-tem. there are a lot of there's a long history of pokemon killers smash killers that wow killers that like they all <laughs> lay defeated Died. on the field yeah. of battle <laughs> um but i do think um char bundle is this like when you were raving about honkai in early 23 okay look honkai is actually still pretty decent out. my my thing is just that i do want to get back to honkai the story of honkai is very very good i i was playing it again over the holiday break and having a good time with it and i was like wow the story of this game is really good the roguelike mode of that game is very good i just was getting tired of doing dailies and stuff like that i was getting tired of checking in on it uh and that's kind of like i wax and wane with that but i'll stand by the fact that i think honkai is a pretty good game uh pal world it's it's got ideas it's it's certainly got takes um and ways of doing things that i did not expect them to there is it scratches a certain itch at some point because one of the main mechanics is that you can put your pals to work. So you can say like, you're going to catch a bunch of Pokemon, (laughs) catch a bunch of pals and take them back to your base and say, okay, I'm getting really tired of having to mine all this lumber or stone or whatever. So I'm going to make my knockoff Wooloo go do it for me. Or I'm going to make my knockoff uh, Meowth go do it for me. And they're going to walk over here and they're going to work at this little logging site I've created or this mining site I've created. And they're going to just harvest a bunch of stone for me. And then this cell array, which is like a floating steam stingray type thing. I can't think of the Pokemon that you would like compare it to, but uh, it kind of floats back and forth and transports those goods. And you can automate the food production. So that way you're always, cause there's hunger meters. There are hunger meters for both your pals and for you. Uh, I do find that actually really engaging this idea of I'm catching pals, not just to put them in my party and battle with. Cause I think the battle stuff is not great. Honestly, mm-hmm. I think that's maybe like the weakest part of the game so far for me. Uh, but the, cause you don't do turn-based battles. It's all just like happening in the world in real time. So you're running around with like a bow and arrow or later once I get further up the tech tree, a gun and like shooting things <laughs> And then your pal is also kind of running around. And it's like, boo! And then like shoots out a little fireball and all that. Uh, and does this little battle cry. But it's all kind of happening in real time. It's not really a turn-based RPG the way that Pokemon is. Uh, so there's there's typing and stuff. But there's not really a lot of strategy, I would say, to that yet. Right. But um, I do think getting different pals that are able to do certain tasks that are really well suited to like, okay, I'm going to catch these because they're actually very good at mining or they're, they're good at production or they can keep my cooler running. So my food doesn't spoil that stuff is actually, really Oh my God. Oh shit. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> what the fuck was that? Hi. And what just fell? Yo, my fucking Yakuza seven poster fell off my door. Oh shit. It's an <laughs> omen. Oh my God. That's that's game free coming to shut the stream down. <laughs> oh shit. Are you okay, Ichiban? Is it okay? Yeah, that's fine. That's okay, good, 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 good. Very sturdy, but oh, That's shit, the funniest. Anyway. Oh man. That's Dang. Wild. Of all days for it to fall. <laughs> it's a it bad has strong, <laughs> the poster has strong opinions. Oh. Yeah, I'll, I'll, suffice to say, uh before any more things fall off of Michael's wall, uh like Power World is interesting it's gonna 
generate a lot of discourse because we also just don't have other video games to talk about. And even I think when Infinite Wealth and other stuff comes out, Power World will still probably be dominating the discourse, the capital D discourse at that point. But I I don't know that it's got the staying power yet. I feel mm-hmm. like this is a fleeting fancy for a lot of people who just want a new game. And I do think it's a fun game to boot up and run around with with friends and do silly things and oh my god look at this i did something really stupid it's got a lot of like edge lordiness in it that kind of makes me a little bit wary of it you know that idea of like isn't it funny that our our you know knockoff monsters are working in a camp and mining stone for you (laughs) ha look at that and i'm like building guns as the trailer yeah isn't it funny if what if a pikachu like had to make guns in a factory and like yeah that i was kind of hoping the game would go beyond that like it would have something to say like some kind of story at least it's the story as far as i can tell is that you have washed up on this island uh it is filled with pals there is a like poaching syndicate that is there that is kind of your team rocket equivalent but they have guns and grenades and things like that and you can like break through their bases and and free captured pals from these like cages that they have them in that was how i got this like slightly rarer pal was by busting through a base uh and there's also trainers they're like bosses at different towers because there's also a lot of breath of the wild in this game you have a glider and there are these big like they're fast travel points and and big towers that you can get to that have like trainer fights inside them, but the trainer fights are just kind of, oh, here's the Totoro electric guy and the trainer's riding on top of them. And you have like kind of this weird, almost soulsy battle where you're doing dodge rolls to the side and shooting arrows while your pal is over there just going like blue and like shooting fireballs and stuff. But <laughs> uh, like me. yeah, it's, I, I, I don't think there's like a story. I think there's just things to do in the world yeah. if that makes sense um no it does know what i mean it's kind of there's like, a eh, wanted whatever. system fun fact i really? didn't find that out by shooting an arrow at a person who would do such a thing <laughs> who, would, <laughs> who would try to do that um so yeah it's it's like a goofy fun game to goof around in I, i'm not surprised that it's just becoming the thing that people are playing in january because there's very little else new in january yeah but I'm going to be really surprised if we're still talking about this by March is, is I guess what I'll say. I think, I think you'll still see news articles and like, Oh, pal world update, whatever, whatever is coming and stuff like that. But I think the heat is on right now just because of the situation that it has launched in. And it was a very well-timed launch window, Uh, but I'm going to be really surprised if we still feel this hot about it by like the time rebirth has come out so that's what i was thinking yeah yeah that's pal world what a weird curiosity what a strange thing uh nadia why don't you take us home Uh, i'm not gonna talk about well i guess it's nostalgic because it's been about a week since i've been to new york so i thought i'd just kind of talk about a little bit what i saw what i did uh the main new thing that happened to me i'm very proud to say that i was called a quote-unquote fucking tourist because (laughs) um it was my fault because i was trying to find out where i was and using my phone and the the one rule in new york city is two rules sorry don't go anywhere near the mascots they'll fuck you up uh you want to talk about the good yakuza characters those would be perfect the oh, assholes there, in times square are, dressed like there elmo are yakuza characters that are dudes in mascot mascots. costumes yeah. <laughs> are they like They're soliciting like known... you for money like shaking you down because they will shake you down oh there's oh. also mr shakedown but that's different <laughs> oh, I know Mr. Shakedown. My husband hates Mr. Shakedown. But uh, no, there was one time I went to New York City and uh, not this time because I, I know to stay the hell away from Times Square. And it was filled with like Elmos. And one of them was like, hey, give me 10 bucks. And the next thing I knew, I was surrounded by like Elmos and Mario's and like Cookie Monsters. Like, oh, no. like holy shit, here's your 10 bucks. Am I getting mugged? I guess this is a buy. Here you go. Legally mugged. Uh, but yeah, I was called a fucking tourist because I... And basically, uh, I made the mistake of walking too slow in the middle of the sidewalk, and you don't do mm-hmm. that. Number two rule of New York is you don't walk slow. Everyone will be perfectly nice to you unless you walk slow. So I kind of like learned from then on to stay on the right side, stay in my lane, so to speak. But being called a fucking tourist was a real uh, 
it's a, a point of pride for me. I've been to New York many times, but yeah, I'm still very much a tourist. Uh, for one thing, I'm one of those tourists everyone hates who's always seems to end up in Manhattan. Um, I've been to other boroughs, of course. I've been to, like, Harlem, best chicken and waffles in the damn world. Oh, man, I, I had, like, some of the best Jewish deli food I've had in my entire life. Mm. Speaking as a Jew, growing up in Toronto, just holy shit. Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, good job, New York. You're... You're one of a kind. I'll say that much. I love you, but I also like leaving you. <laughs> I get told I, I get called a tourist every single time I go because without fail, the first time I try to swipe a card on the metro, I will mess it up somehow. Yeah. Wow. You, can number, tap, you can tap your card now. You got to tap, yeah. Yeah. So well, so I always do the the metro like like the the ones that you get from the machine that you like yeah. swipe through, and I always either do it on the wrong side, or mm-hmm. I like miss swipe it. But either way, I will, like, go through very confidently, like, I've got it this time, and then, like, get gutted by that, <laughs> that bar. And then, <laughs> you, and then I'll, like, swipe it a few times. Last time I did it, I was swiping it on the wrong side, and some dude just walked by and, like, just walked through on the side that I was swiping him for. And he was like, thanks, man. And I was like, <laughs> what the <sighs> fuck? I guess yeah. that happens a lot in New York. I've seen the videos where people just kind of double up on the fares. I haven't oh, I mean, really had that happen to me in Toronto yet. Gate. Like, that's, yeah, yeah. Like, you want to talk about... Yo, fair, fair evasion. Yeah, yeah. that's that's yeah. a that's a whole mini game out there. Oh, sure is. <laughs> that's that's a new yuck is a mini game. <laughs> yep, fair evasion. Yep. So uh, you grew up in uh, um, where was it? Uh, no, you grew up in the Austin. Midwest. No, I grew up in Austin. Yeah. Does Austin have a uh, a subway? It has. <laughs> so it has. Around the time that I was in like middle to high school, they built a light rail out here that kind of runs from north austin down to uh like central like downtown austin near where like the convention center is and that was super nice because growing up in north austin it meant that like during south by southwest i could hop on the light rail and head down fun fact about that is that they did have a thing where they're like you have to buy a ticket to get on the light rail and buy a trip other fun thing about that is no one checks that they kind of just honor system it And let me tell you, nobody is paying for that light rail, (laughs) Um, which like at the end of the day, I'm kind of going like maybe we should just have publicly taxed, like funded public transportation. What a wild concept. But uh, yeah, so I have I have been on a, a rail system many times caught myself there uh but, but I, uh, riding like riding new york subway though that must be like kind of fun for you or an experience oh at it's least. it's i mean it was not the first few times it, yeah it's whimsical <laughs> um it's like it's like going to disney world all right so the first time you go to disney world you're just amazed by everything happening around you. You're just like, what? I'm underground. Well, not at Disney. I mean, maybe at Disney World, you're underground. underground but Disney, um, yeah, <laughs> but like, like at Disney World, you're like, look at all the magic around me. Look at all these sights and sounds I've never seen before. For me, that was the subway. It was like, I'm underground. There's like big rat. I've seen this in movies, but now I'm There's here. I'm terrified. I'm terrified of the rails. Like, I'm terrified of getting stuck on the sub people made that seem like it was going to be way more of an issue of people hopping down onto the rails and needing to get back out. A lot of isekai anime made me think that was much more of a thing than it was actually going to be. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, you, you get wowed by all of the, the novelty of it. And now I've been to New York so many times now that I'm just like, yeah, I'm just getting on the subway. Like it's yeah. whatever. Uh, it's, it's a thing that exists that I'm using to get around. And, in some ways, I like that because that makes it more commonplace, and I wish that it was more commonplace everywhere else in the world. But uh, I don't know; it's it's lost its luster, I guess I will say. Just like I'll, uh, seeing think getting... Mickey smoking at Disney World. You saw <laughs> Mickey smoking at Disney World? No, no. Ah, uh, damn! Stand down, That'd be Disney awesome. agents. I did not see that. <laughs> any Disney? Yeah, I was gonna say any Disney employee. If you saw that, number one, they take your eyes out. Number two, that di- that. That Mickey would have had its, th- its throat slit and thrown into the the bog by the Grand Floridian. Damn. Yeah, yeah. On that note, <laughs> thank you for tuning in to Acts of the Blood God, Michael. Thank you so much for joining us. Yes, yeah, that was yeah. great. Good to have Shout you. Shout out for the yeah. folks at home. Where can they find you and all the stuff you do and all the lovely work that you could do for those who have money? Uh, fuck. I don't know. I don't... Oh, okay. Well, plug your mm, stuff. 
Well, you can find me and all of my bullshit at Michael P. Hyam on Twitter or at Hyam Michael on Instagram, which I do not use. Um, but you should follow me there anyway. I like your cat photos. Mm. That's for mm. damn sure. You should look at my yeah. DMs on Instagram. It's like all these all these girls I'm like sending like heart eyes emojis to. It's all because they're cats. They post they're your cats. cats. Yeah. Oh. Um, so if you post cats on uh, Instagram, I will give them heart eyes because I love them. Um, you can catch some of my work over at, still at GameSpot.com, and I'll have something cooking on IGN.com as well. Uh, and p- stay tuned. Uh, n- another podcast for y'all to listen to will be uh, be happening sometime next month. It is not about video games. So, oh. Yeah. Oh. So not, not, what else um, is there in life? <laughs> there's, turns out there's a lot more in oh, life. Oh, shit. Um, I don't just know. Give it a try. <laughs> yeah, but uh, me and the boy Jan Ochoa from Giant Bomb will be uh, doing cooking up something that is non-video game related. It's gonna be fun. Awesome. Heck yeah! As always, you Yo. can find Nadia at Nadia Oxford, myself at C Moosey, and Catbot at the underscore Catbot, and find us at Blood God Pod on all things. Check out the Patreon. Follow us here on Twitch. You know, hit that yeah. follow. Tune in every nine a.m. PT Saturday and to be determined other days for <laughs> for other streams uh and and hang around but for nadia for michael and myself thank you so much for tuning in we'll catch you next time on acts of the blood god peace